Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So you might be rolling your eyeballs thinking, oh my gosh, what is she going to talk to us about? This is a, a, an administrator of a trauma program who's clinically current, by the way, and she's going to talk to us about performance improvement and patient safety. I have no disclosures. Um, and here's our roadmap to today for the next few minutes, actually. Um, there's something in it for each one of you. So we're going to talk about trauma performance improvement and patient safety for frontline trauma care providers. We're going to talk about identifying issues, doing a case review, the corrective action, the loop closure cycle, and we're going to talk about two things that are really important, the human factors element and just culture. So that's our roadmap. So seriously, who really cares about this stuff? I know I can see your faces. There's enough light in the audience, and people are like, oh my gosh. This is what people do when they have an office job or a desk job. I don't know what those jobs are. I do have a desk, but I'm out and about enough to keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on in trauma. So hopefully by the end of this talk, in the next 20 minutes, you're going to understand why you should care even more about performance improvement and patient safety. But first I want to mention a couple of things. So performance improvement and patient safety is all about quality, meeting and providing the standard of care, or in my opinion, I will think we should succeed or exceed the standard of care. And every trauma center is required to have a very robust performance improvement patient safety program. But this is really difficult to do. And nobody is, is perfect. If you go to any trauma center, level one, two, three, four, and five, if you were inspecting or accrediting that trauma center and they say, we have very few PI issues, I don't believe you or we're perfect, nobody's perfect. Nobody is perfect, no trauma care provider is perfect, no trauma program is perfect. The other rea reality that makes trauma PI a challenge is that it has to be multidisciplinary because trauma is a team sport, right? It's not just ED staff, the ED is the gateway. We include pre-hospital care providers in every case review that we do. We look at every step along the way from pre-hospital right on through to discharge and sometimes clinic follow-up visits and readmissions. But it has to be multidisciplinary because there's multiple teams caring for the trauma patient. The trauma surgeon's the one in charge, that's an established fact, but we've got emergency medicine, ED nurses, imaging, blood bank, um, interventional radiology, the operating room, anesthesiology, there's hundreds of departments, divisions, and services that we interface. And this is really a complex issue when we're looking at patient safety and PI. The other component that makes uh, trauma PI a little bit challenging is that when you have a bad outcome with a trauma patient or an adverse event, it doesn't always mean the care is bad. If you were to look at a case, it's usually a domino effect. It's frequently a communication issue, and there's frequently more than one issues with the same case that went bad. And most errors in trauma care are related to a system issue. So I don't think this is a surprise, but what is your involvement in trauma PI? Well, you are required to practice at the standard of care, or you lose your license and you want to actually exceed the standard of care. If you're giving care, this is how I think of it, if you're going to give care, think about the care that you would want your spouse to have, that you would want to receive as a patient, you would want your parents to have, or your children to have. I call it the mother test. Did this pass the mother test? So the other involvement, you want to be on the solution side of things. So if you know of a problem, you definitely want to be part of the solution, especially if you were involved in the error or if it had something to do with your practice, your level of practice. You may be on the receiving end of education, which is part of corrective action, or you may be the person that's giving the education. Maybe you're in a supervisory or a manager or director position. 
What if you're interested in moving up the clinical ladder? There's all sorts of projects that you can do that are related to performance improvement. So if you want to go from a clinical nurse one to a clinical nurse two, three, or four, if you came and talked to me and said, hey, I, I, I want a project, I always have a list in my back pocket for people that are interested in, in clinical advancement. We are professionally obligated to stay on top of current standard of practice, current literature, that's a professional obligation and it's the right thing to do. So I commend all of you for attending this conference, for reading journals, journals and so on and so forth. That's part of keeping current with the current standard of trauma care. So back in 2008, Ivaturi wrote that trauma is um, very complicated and it's prone to error because Normally, we have low volume, high risk. So even high volume trauma centers, it's still low volume, high risk. So if you have any background in performance improvement, low volume plus high risk equals uh, be suspicious. There could be a potential for an error there. We know that trauma is high acuity and very time sensitive. We want short scene times. We want short ED throughput times. We want to get from the ED to the OR. Rapidly, we have to have an OR open 24 and 7. So it's high acuity, low volume, high risk, and very time sensitive. And what Ivaturi said in these next two points was that there are important decisions that are made on incomplete data. Not anymore. There's a lot of research that's being done by our colleagues in trauma. And he goes on to say, decisions most prone to error are those for which there is the least amount of scientific data to guide processes. But guess what? The current state of trauma in trauma centers is we use clinical practice management guidelines that are evidence-based. So we have the capability. So I would ask you, are your clinical practice management guidelines well known? Are they accessible? Are they easy to read? Are they easy to access when you need them? If they're not, you've got a project when you get home. Do you work at a facility that has a culture for safe patient care? Now, I think the assumption is, of course we are. But go back to your facility or your agency and start to ask questions. What is our culture of safety here? And there's four principles for those of you that are in a supervisory or a management position. There's four principles for a culture of safety. Strong leadership, a very strong culture for safety, redundancy, safety nets if you will, and a really strong system design and learning environment. I almost hate to mention the Joint Commission. For those of us that work in the hospital environment, they arrive unannounced. People break out in a cold sweat. The command center opens. But one of the things that Joint Commission asks us to do as, a, as an accredited facility is to proactively explore potential system failures. So if you're in an agency or a hospital, and you guys are doing great, haven't had one of those bad cases for a while, and you think, OK, now what are we going to do with PI and trauma? Well, start looking across the continuum of care and where is there an area of vulnerability? So here's an example. When I first started at Cedars-Sinai, I did this because we didn't have data and I needed to figure out what project are we going to do first with performance to make it a safer environment for our patients. Well, I realized that we didn't have a naming convention for trauma patients that arrived unidentified. So trauma alpha, trauma beta, trauma channel, and so on and so forth, right? So every trauma center should have one of these um, processes set up. So what we did is, was exactly what Joint Commission asked us to do. We proactively explored the potential for a system error um, failure. And the reason that this is so important, why you need a trauma naming convention, is that you can't do anything without a medical record number. Can't get blood can't get them in the system, can't get your lab results, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's shift gears and talk about error analysis. So we don't wait necessarily for something bad to happen, 
but things happen in the heat of the moment. So let's say that you're aware of an issue. What's the first thing you're gonna do? You're gonna look for opportunities for improvement. But at the same time, you need to have the trauma foundation, your knowledge in trauma, to understand what to look for. And that is the current standard of care. So this is why we have all these trauma courses out there. They all have four letters, and they all stand for something important. PHTLS has five, pardon me. It doesn't matter what course you take, but take a trauma course that's nationally recognized. This is part of the credentialing process, not only for physicians and surgeons, but for nurses and pre-hospital providers. And stay current in the literature. So we have an issue with a patient and we need to do a case review. What does that look like? The issue's identified and the first thing you should do is just take a deep breath and not get emotional about it. It's easy to say, it's not easy to do. When I get a report and it's usually on a Monday morning or three o'clock on a you know, Saturday uh, afternoon and I'm like, oh great. Here we go again. And then I'm like, wait a minute. I just want to collect the facts. You're on a fact-finding mission. Keep the emotion out of it. Most importantly, was it such a serious event that you need to do something right away so you don't harm another patient? What's in a good example of this? Your trauma pager stopped working because the whole paging system in the medical center went down, went down. So what is your backup? Do the staff in the emergency department that activate the trauma team, do they have the trauma team's cell phone numbers? Well, if they don't, guess what? You're gonna have a laminated copy right by the charge nurse's desk. So you're gonna mitigate right away depending on the level of the issue. Validate it, was it a real issue or was it just a personality problem and two people were fighting in the trauma bay during resuscitation. Is that a PI issue or is that an issue to do with professional conduct? And when we look at a case review, it's similar to a root cause analysis. So what exactly is a root cause analysis? It's essentially we look at the patient care from beginning until today or until they're discharged and we look at every detail and we sequence it, we time it, we look at all aspects of everybody that contributed to that patient's care. So let's talk about loop closure. So first, we have the issue. We verify that this was, in fact, an issue. Then we talk about how many levels of review does this need. So if it's a trauma issue and you're at a trauma center, it needs to go to your trauma program manager. The trauma program manager is going to talk to your trauma medical director about this. And then we're going to say, okay, what departments, what divisions do we need to get this issue referred to? So I'm going to, if it's an issue in the emergency department and the operating room, I'm going to be talking to those nurse managers and those nurses that were in charge. If it's more serious, then it goes to committee, multidisciplinary peer review, nursing case review committee, and so on and so forth. So essentially, when there's an issue, it gets referred to anybody that's been involved in the care. We discuss the case, we agree on the corrective action, we roll out the com corrective action, and then we monitor it to make sure that the fix to the problem matches the problem and we don't want to see repeat issues. If you're seeing repeat issues, there's a problem either with the corrective action or with rolling out the corrective action. Maybe everybody didn't get the education. So if you look at the performance improvement cycle, it's called Plan, Do, Check, Act, PDCA. Pretty straightforward, right? So let's talk about part of the loop closure process, which is corrective action, but that sounds a little strong, right? Sounds a little bit punitive. So we call them opportunities for improvement. And what opportunities for improvement means is that it's a structured effort to improve performance and avoid these repeat errors. The solution to correct the issue needs to be patient-specific, provider-specific, and system-specific.
So what are some uh, corrective actions or opportunities for improvement? Education is the number one corrective action. Is that frightening? It's not. It's just education. Maybe we need to implement a clinical practice management guideline that's evidence-based. Or maybe we have a guideline, but it's outdated. Or maybe it just needs some additional information. We don't have a lot of policies. Policies is a very strict term. It means you must follow this algorithm 100% of the time. You are legally obligated to follow this algorithm 100% of the time. At CEDARS, we have two policies. One is the trauma team activation policy. We have very strict criteria for that, and we meet it. We monitor it, and we meet it. And the other one is admission of the trauma patient. They have to be admitted to the trauma surgeon unless otherwise specified by the trauma surgeon in charge. Other examples, usually there's system problems when you have a patient care issue. There's a system problem somewhere along the line. The more serious ones, remediation and counseling, have to do with a clinician practicing below the standard of care, or they're practicing to intentionally harm the patient. So my colleague and friend, Dr. Rotundo, who's past chair of the COT, he said, Heidi, opportunities for improvement is still a little bit inflammatory because Improvement means that people might feel shame that they did something wrong, so just call them opportunities. We want to move away from a punitive environment. But what I want to emphasize here is that whatever corrective action you and your colleagues decide upon, it needs to be matched appropriately with the error. That's key. Don't have a big corrective action plan going that has nothing to do with the mistake that you made. So let's shift gears and talk about educational corrective action versus punitive measures against a clinician. So most corrective actions are educational. We want to move to get to the point where we're eliminating a culture of punitive consequences. That's instilling a culture of fear. And then people, if they feel fearful, will avoid participating in any kind of case review or corrective action process. And we do want to make sure we've got a culture of non-retaliation. If you are not sure if your hospital or your agency that you work at has a policy for non-retaliation, I would put that on your list of things to check when you go back to work tomorrow or Monday. You should have a non-retaliation policy for reporting. That's vital. So let's move on and talk about human error. As much as I'd like to believe that everybody in this room is a really strong trauma clinician, doesn't matter how good you are, at some point you've made an error in the care that you provide. And I don't believe it's intentional. But then again, not every error is human error. But let's talk about it. It's often the best people who make the worst mistakes. Show me your hands. Who's made a mistake? Those that didn't raise your hand, I'm not sure I believe you. Maybe you didn't know it. When I was a clinician, I worked so many night shifts. There wasn't a limit on how many night shifts that you could work at that time. I worked so many night shifts in the emergency department. I'm not so sure I was awake enough or coherent enough to know if I actually made a mistake. I do know I made some errors. It's often the best people who make the worst mistakes, and the same set of circumstances can provoke similar errors. So what are the factors that lead to human error? Do any of these look familiar? Anybody work fatigued? Anybody have emotional stress? You have a fight with your partner or your spouse, and then you go and work a trauma resuscitation? Or what about multitasking? We know that there's science out there that says multitasking is not good. How many of you have been in a trauma resuscitation where you don't multitask? It's almost impossible, right? So we're error prone. What about noise? Who's work short staffed? Is there a culture of safety in the agency or the hospital that you work at? Let's talk about just culture. We know that people make errors. We know that errors cause accidents. 
and they result in death and complications and adverse outcomes. And one approach is to seek out who made that error and punish them. This is not just culture. It instills fear. Just culture understands that an individual may be at fault, but frequently the system is at fault. Punishing without changing the system just perpetuates a really rotten environment, not a safe, supportive, high standard of patient care environment. Honest disclosure without fear of ret retribution is really a key component of just culture. But let's talk about breach of duty. We can categorize it as human error that's unintentional, or we can categorize it as at-risk behavior, so you're fully aware that you are drifting from the standard of care. And then there's reckless behavior. And when, if, you have, if you know of people or you've practiced at-risk or reckless behavior, you can expect punitive measures. You can expect to be fired or lose your license. I found something when I was doing the literature review that Dr. Polk wrote. So whenever we look at measuring something, whenever we do performance improvement, we like to measure our outcomes. And you need a threshold. Do you want to meet an 80% or a 90% threshold for error rates or complications? And to quote, he says, the only number we should target is zero. And we ought to challenge ourselves to approach zero adverse events in a progressively large number of patients, knowing we're going to fall short of that standard. Nobody's perfect. It's been said, better is not a number, soon is not a time, and try is having granted yourself permission to fail. So in summary, what I'd like you to leave here with is that in the current culture for trauma performance improvement and patient safety, it's a just culture. We strive to be non-punitive unless you intentionally deviate from the standard of care. And understand what your role is. Is it to be part of the solution? I would say yes. And keep in mind that most issues we see in trauma PI are systems and communications issues with education as the corrective action. So at this point, I just want to thank you all for wel welcoming me back to the podium. I want to thank you all for sticking it out until the last session of the day. And I started out with a really beautiful picture of Arizona, and my heart is still in Arizona. But I just want to say that if you come to LA, look me up. I'm at Cedar sinai um, It's a beautiful city. So in closing, thank you all so much for all the hard work that you do and the trauma patient care that you give every day. Thank you. <laughs> you can stay up, you